Hello friends. Many times when we talk about electrical installations, electronics or instrumentation, we use the concepts of resistance, reactance and impedance. For example, we talk about the grounding resistance, the input impedance of an instrument, the impedance of the ground loop, or for example the reactance of a luminaire. In this video we are going to see in a simple way, the meaning of these concepts, as well as the differences between them. My name is Robert, and I hope this video is of interest to you. In that case don't forget to drop a like, subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. When we apply a voltage to an installation or electronic circuit, normally, unless there is a short circuit, the current is limited to a certain value, and if the voltage varies, the current usually varies too. In this way we can establish a relationship between voltage and current that will depend on the type of load or component. At an electrical or electronic level, we can speak of three basic loads or components, which we call passives, such as resistors, inductors and capacitors. We say passive components because as soon as we apply voltage to them, they give rise to the circulation of a certain current. On the other hand, we have the components that we would say active, such as diodes, thyristors or transistors that normally require a certain level of voltage to be activated, and are actively used to modify, or amplify signals. Let's look at these three passive components one by one. A resistor is an electrical or electronic element that when an alternating or direct voltage is applied to it, the current through it is always proportional to the voltage. We can express this situation with the famous Ohm's law. Where V is the voltage applied to the circuit, I the current that appears in the circuit, and R is a constant value that depends on the resistor used in this circuit, and that we call resistance, whose value depends on the type of material from which the resistor is made and of the construction and physical dimensions of the resistor. The resistance value of a resistor is expressed in units of ohms, in honor of the German physicist and mathematician George Simon Ohm. The higher the value of the resistance, the greater the opposition offered by the resistor to the circulation of the current, causing it to take on smaller values. This opposition manifested by a resistor to the circulation of current is independent of the value of the voltage applied and its frequency. It is caused by the collisions of electrons with the atomic structure within the material of the resistor, it would be like a kind of friction, which causes the resistor to heat up and dissipate energy in the form of heat. That is, there is a conversion of electrical energy into thermal energy given by Joule's law, described by the following formula. Being P the power dissipated in the form of heat in the resistor, I the current flowing through the resistor, and are the resistance of the resistor. If we apply to the resistance an alternating voltage that evolves in time as a sine wave, and we use Ohm's law, we can obtain the current wave, and see that it is also a sine wave that is in phase with the voltage wave. From this last expression we can obtain the relationship between the peak value of the current and the peak value of the voltage. And taking into account the relationship between the peak values and the effective values for a sine wave, we can obtain the relationship between the effective values of voltage and current in a resistance, that is, the Ohm's law for effective values. Let us now look at the inductor. Any conductor induces a magnetic field around it when a current flows through it, hence the name of inductor. To intensify this effect, the insulated conductor is shaped into turns, thus creating a coil, so that the magnetic field becomes very intense inside. And if in addition, a magnetic core made of iron or ferrite is introduced inside the coil, then this magnetic field is even more intense. The properties of an inductor to generate a magnetic field are given by a parameter called inductance, represented by the letter L, expressed in Henry's, in honor of the American scientist Joseph Henry. Since the real coil is built for example with copper wire, it will always have a small resistance, although for this study we can neglect it. In the case of an inductor, such as a coil, the relationship between the voltage at its terminals and the current through it can be obtained from Faraday's law of induction. In other words, the voltage at the inductor terminals is equal to the inductance multiplied by the speed with which the current changes in relation to time. The higher the rate of change of the current, the higher the voltage. In this way, if the current is constant, for example if we feed the coil with a battery, after the first instant, the rate of change of the current will be zero, and therefore in the coil terminals there will be zero volts, that is, it will behave as a short circuit. Now we can consider a current in the coil with a sine wave shape. If we use the formula that relates voltage, current and inductance in the coil and we apply a simple derivation rule, 
we can obtain the expression of the voltage waveform. From this voltage we can obtain the relationship between the peak values of the voltage and the current and as we can see, it is very useful to define a new parameter called inductive reactance, X sub L, in this way the expression for the peak value is greatly simplified. Inductive reactance, X sub L, like resistance, is expressed in units of ohms. Again, if we consider sine waves, we can apply a simple relationship between peak values and effective values, which allows us to obtain the relationship between the effective values of voltage and current in an inductor. Expression similar to those obtained by applying Ohm's law to a resistor in a circuit with alternating voltage, but in this case substituting the resistance by the inductive reactance. As we can see in these formulas, the higher the inductive reactance, the lower the current flowing through the inductor. If we now remember the definition of inductive reactance, we can see that the inductive reactance increases with increasing self-induction, L, and also increases with increasing frequency. Unlike resistance, inductive reactance depends on the frequency of the signal. Therefore, the greater the self-induction, L, of the coil and the greater the frequency, F, of the signal, the more opposition the inductor exerts to the passage of current, making the current smaller. If we now look at the waveforms of voltage and current, we will see that in an inductor the current lags 90 degrees with respect to the voltage. As we can see, the maximum of the voltage waveform occurs 90 degrees before the maximum of the current waveform. And if we calculate the power in the inductor we will see that its average value is zero, that is to say, in an ideal inductor energy is not dissipated in the form of heat. The energy that is taken from the voltage source is stored in the form of a magnetic field, and is released back to the voltage source on a repetitive basis. This is another big difference from a resistor, in which there was a net dissipation of energy. Finally, we have to see the behavior of the capacitor. Capacitors are components that are built from metal sheets or plates, spaced a small distance from each other. In this way, when a voltage is applied to a capacitor, the metallic surfaces become electrically charged, appearing an electric field between them. Capacitors are capable of storing energy through this electric field that appears inside them. Let us first consider the case that the capacitor is connected to a direct voltage circuit. In this situation, the free electrons of the plate connected to the positive pole will be attracted towards this pole of the power supply, leaving the plate positively charged. In turn, the other plate will increase the number of electrons and become negatively charged. This displacement of electrons results in an electric current that lasts for a limited time, until the electric field inside the capacitor is strong enough to prevent the displacement of more electrons. The intensity of that electric field will depend on a characteristic of the capacitor, called capacitance. Once this time has elapsed, the capacitor will have been charged and will no longer allow the circulation of current. The charge stored in the capacitor is proportional to the voltage applied and to a parameter called capacitance, that depends on the physical characteristics of the capacitor, such as the surface of the plates, the distance between them, and the insulating material between the plates. Capacitance is represented by the letter F, and has units of Farad, in honor of the British physicist Michael Faraday. But since this unit is very large, submultiples of it are often used, such as the microfarad. As we have done with the resistor and the inductor, we can now consider that a sinusoidal alternating voltage is applied to the capacitor. Using the relationship between the charge and the voltage, we can obtain the evolution of the charge over time, and since the current is defined as the speed with which the charge varies with time, using a simple derivation formula, then we can obtain the current as a function of the voltage and the capacitance. Applying a simple trigonometric rule, we obtain a result that shows us that the current waveform leads the voltage waveform by half pi, that is, by 90 degrees. Finally, we can use the definition of the angular frequency to make the previous formula simpler. From this expression we can obtain the relationship between the peak values of the current and the voltage and as we can see, it is very useful to define a new parameter called capacitive reactance, X sub C, in this way we can simplify the expression with the peak values. Capacitive reactance, like resistance and inductive reactance, is expressed in units of ohms. Again, if we consider sine waves, we can apply the relationship between peak values and effective values, which allows us to obtain the relationship between the effective values of voltage and current in a capacitor. Expressions similar to those obtained previously for a resistor and an inductor, 
but in this case using the capacitive reactants. As we can see in these formulas, the higher the capacitive reactants, the lower the current flowing through the capacitor. If we now recall the definition of capacitive reactants, since capacitance and frequency are in the denominator, the higher the capacitance of the capacitor and the higher the frequency of the signal, the lower the capacitive reactance will be, that is, the opposition exerted by the capacitor to the passage of current, making the current to be greater. Unlike resistance, capacitive reactance depends on the frequency of the signal. If we now look at the voltage and current waveforms, we will see that in a capacitor the current is 90 degrees ahead of the voltage. As we can see, the capacitor has a behavior opposite to that of the inductor. And if we calculate the power in the capacitor we will see that its average value is zero, that is to say, in an ideal capacitor energy is not dissipated in the form of heat. The energy that is taken from the voltage source is stored in the form of an electric field, and is transferred back to the voltage source on a repetitive basis. Now that we know the behavior of these three passive components individually, it is time to combine them in series in an AC circuit. We know that the opposition that these elements exert to the flow of the current depends on the value of the resistance, the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance, all of them expressed in ohms. We could be tempted to add these three values arithmetically, as we would do for example in a circuit with resistors in series, but this is not valid here since the voltages in each of the elements are not in phase with each other. The voltages must be added taking into account the phase shift, and for this we can use the so-called complex numbers, or we can use a graphical method based on the sum of phasors. Here I am not going to use complex numbers given the initial difficulty that they usually represent if you have not practiced with them. I will use the graphical phasors method which is easier to visualize. In a phasor diagram we can represent the evolution in time of the sinusoidal waveforms as a rotation of the phasor associated with the voltage and current, where the length of the phasor is given by the maximum value or peak value of the waveform, and the angle of rotation would be given by the value of the omega angular frequency, which is precisely where the name comes from. As the three components are in series, the current is the same in each of the components, the length of the voltage phasors is given by the peak values that we have already seen previously. Now we can represent the phasors of the voltages and currents in each of the components, as if they were the hands of a clock, and for easy visualization we take the current phasor, which is the same for all three components, initially pointing at 3 o'clock. Since the phase shift between voltage and current was 0 degrees in the resistor, its voltage phasor will also point to 3 o'clock. In the inductor the voltage was 90 degrees ahead of the current. Therefore, its voltage phasor will point to 12 o'clock, if we consider that the phasor rotates counterclockwise. Finally, in the capacitor the voltage lagged 90 degrees with respect to the current, so its voltage phasor will point to 6 o'clock, again considering that the phasor rotates counterclockwise. As we can see, the voltage phasors of the inductor and that of the capacitor are aligned, but pointing in opposite directions, and therefore we can calculate the resultant of their effects simply by subtracting them. In this way, the phasor diagram is simplified to just two phasors that form a right triangle. To calculate the maximum or peak value of the resulting voltage sum of these two phasors, we can apply the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that for a right triangle the length of the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths from the other two sides. And if we group this expression a bit, and apply the square root to both sides, we can obtain the relationship between the peak current and the peak voltage. To simplify the expression even more, it is very useful to define a new parameter called impedance, which we name with the letter Z. Which makes the previous expression look a lot like Ohm's law, although in this case the impedance parameter appears instead of the resistance. And if we consider sinusoidal waveforms again, we can obtain the expressions that relate the effective values of the voltage and the current through the impedance. Therefore, we can now answer the question we asked ourselves at the beginning of this video, about the differences between resistance, reactance and impedance. In summary we have, resistance is the opposition that a resistor exerts to the passage of current due to collisions of electrons with atoms within the resistor material, which results in the conversion of electrical energy from the source into heat, according to the Joule's law. In a resistor the voltage and current waveform are in phase. Resistance does not depend on frequency. The inductive reactance would be the opposition that an inductor exerts to the passage of alternating current. 
In an ideal inductor there are no heat losses. The electrical energy from the source is converted into energy associated with the magnetic field in the coil. In an inductor the voltage waveform leads the current waveform by 90 degrees. The higher the frequency of the signal, the greater the opposition to the passage of current, that is, the greater the inductive reactance and the lower the current through the inductor. Capacitive reactance would be the opposition that a capacitor exerts to the passage of alternating current. In an ideal capacitor there are no heat losses. The electrical energy from the source is converted into energy associated with the electric field inside the capacitor. In a capacitor the voltage waveform lags the current waveform by 90 degrees. The higher the frequency of the signal, the lower the opposition to the passage of current, that is, the lower the capacitive reactance and the greater the current through the capacitor. Finally, the impedance of a circuit would be the total opposition exerted by the different elements of the circuit, resistors, inductors and capacitors together to the passage of alternating current. The voltage may lag or lead the current, with a phase shift between 0 and 90 degrees depending on the values of inductive reactance and capacitive reactants. The influence of the frequency on the impedance will also depend on the combination of the inductive and capacitive reactants of the circuit. And so, we have reached the end of this presentation that I hope you have found interesting. If that is the case, don't forget to drop a like so that I know that you liked it. In future videos I will discuss more topics related to electrical and electronic circuits, so if you don't want to miss it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and activate the notification bell. See you in a next video. Bye.